We live in a dangerous world. Recently, I've had three people who attend this church tell me about being in dangerous situations. One had to do with a lady that unexpectedly had to stay late. And to get out of the building she was in, she couldn't get out the way she went in because the doors were locked. She had to go out another way which took her down a dark alley in the middle of the night, and she was concerned. Another situation involved a man who was filling up his gas tank at a filling station. And there was another car thereby with, uh, I think, three or four young men in it. And one of them looked at the fellow that goes to this church and said, let's take him down. Oh, no. And he said... I was a little concerned. The, four, the third involved a lady who was actually a clerk in a store and she contacted me because there was an armed robbery nearby and she was concerned that her store might be next. Now let me ask you a question. Have you faced any dangers lately? Raise your hand. Have you, you faced any dangers? Interesting. Not just lately, but period. Have you ever been in a situation where you've feared for your life? I tried to think of situations in my case, and I thought of being on an airplane when I thought it was going to crash. It only dropped 500 feet, and it didn't, but uh, obviously I'm here. But uh, it was a bit of a concern to me in the descent, needless to say. Well, what do you do in those situations? Well, of course, what everybody does is they pray. Matter of fact, there used to be an expression called foxhole religion. That is in World War II, I think it was, the men in the foxhole began to pray, and uh, obviously, uh, appropriately, and they called it foxhole religion. But so all know to pray, even if you're not a Christian, you know to pray in that situation. But what else do you do? Is there something else that you can take out of that kind of a situation? And the answer is yes. If you are fearful, you need to know Psalm 27. So turn with me in your Bible to Psalm 27. David says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked come against me to eat my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumble and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy on me, upon me, and answer me. When they said, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, my face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. 
I will have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. This is an interesting psalm. Obviously, David is facing some serious danger. And he has a very vivid way of expressing it. He says in verse 2 that there are wicked people who want to eat his flesh. He calls them his enemies. So he is facing a dangerous situation and he is fearful apparently because he says in verse 1, whom shall I fear? So putting those two things together, I'm going to suggest that David was facing a fearful situation. Now the question is, how did he handle it? What did he do? Well, the first thing he did is he goes off into a rather long discussion about the fact that he was confident that the Lord would, would protect him. So he begins with the question that really expresses that confidence. Confidence is the word that describes the opening movement of this passage. He says in verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now just notice his uh, metaphors for the Lord. He calls the Lord his light. He calls the Lord his salvation. He calls the Lord his strength. Now, all of those things are his uh, metaphors or his images, if you will, of the Lord. So that light is probably a reference to the fact the Lord is my understanding. But that word in the Psalms is used of all kinds of positive things. Like truth and goodness and joy and vitality and just life itself. So the Lord is my light. He lets me know uh, what's going on. I have understanding from him is the basic and root idea. But also, he says, the Lord is my salvation. And as you've heard me say before, that's different than New Testament salvation. The word salvation is used in the New Testament of the forgiveness of sins, of being delivered from the penalty of sin. So that you get that by trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior for the gift of eternal life. But in the Psalms, that word is used primarily of being delivered. As a matter of fact, the word means to be delivered. So he is saying, I am confident that the Lord is going to deliver me. He says, he is my strength, perhaps a reference to the Lord being his stronghold. So his point is, why should I be afraid? If you got a bodyguard like that, why should you be afraid? And that's why he's asking the question, of whom shall I fear? And I read this passage and I'm immediately reminded of Romans chapter 8. As a matter of fact, when I first became a Christian, I don't know why, uh, but there was a verse in Romans 8 that became my life's verse. I hung on to that verse for years. If I signed my autograph, I put that verse under it. It's Romans 8, 31. If God be for you, who could be against you? Gave great comfort to my soul and strengthened me spiritually. I've since changed my verse to another one in 2 Corinthians that says something about being your servant for Christ's sake. But that verse was the foundation of my spiritual life uh, when I first became a Christian. And it lasted for years and years and years. So that's what David is saying. <laughs> God's for me. Why should I be afraid of any enemy that I might have? So when he was facing fearful danger, since the Lord was his light in a dark danger, he was the deliverance from his danger. And so David concluded, I will not fear. Now keep in mind that what he's doing is expressing his confidence in the Lord. 
So he continues that in verse 2. When the wicked came against me to eat my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Now the key word in that verse is the word came. Notice he says, when the wicked came, he's referring to a past experience. So he said, you know, I've been here before. I've faced danger before. I've faced death before. And surely he means in some of his military exploits. And he said, when the wicked came against me to destroy me, to eat my flesh, he said, you know, the Lord was my deliverance and they stumbled and they fell. So again, he's expressing his confidence based on his past experience. Now with that in mind, look at verse 3. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though an army may rise against me, in this I will be confident. Now what's critical here is that in verse 2, he's talking about a past experience. In verse 3, he's projecting that past experience to a present experience or a future experience. So he says, you know, <laughs> I had people want to destroy me before. So, though an army encampus around me, I'm not going to fear. Why? Because the Lord is my deliverer. The Lord is my strength, my stronghold, my fortress. I've seen him do it before, and so I'm confident he will do it again. Interesting. He goes on to say in verse 4, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that I will seek, uh, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. All right, now, uh, he's confident that the Lord is going to deliver him from this danger. And so he says, here's the one thing I want. Now, if you're in danger, what's the one thing you want? To get out of there with your hide, right? This is what he says. The Lord has delivered me in the past. The Lord is, I'm con you can put an army against me. The Lord will take care of that. That's a minor matter. It's just an army. And, and, and so I'm confident because the one thing I want is to know the Lord. Look at that. The one thing I desire is that I may seek and dwell in the house of the Lord. Now, for David, they hadn't built the temple yet. And he had moved the tabernacle up to Jerusalem, at, we, probably at this point, and there was a tent in Jerusalem where there was the Ark of the Covenant. So what he's saying is, the Lord, wherever he's at, and he's in this danger, the Lord's going to deliver me, and I'm going to, well, all I want is just to know the Lord. I want to be in the house of the Lord. So you're out there somewhere and you're in danger, and the desire is, I just want to be on church, in church on Sunday. <laughs> That's the parallel to us. But it's more than that. Because what he wants to do is to be preoccupied with the Lord. So he says, I, that I may seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and behold the beauty of the Lord. So it's not just going back to the house of the Lord. It's I want to go to the house of the Lord and just contemplate the beauty of the Lord. So in other words, I don't want to just go to church. I want to go to church so I can learn more about the Lord and inquire in his temple. Wow. I want you to know That's deep stuff. You want to know the Lord. I've asked you a number of times you want to grow lately. You want, do you want to just want to know the Lord? I'm telling you, if you ever get a taste of this, uh, there's nothing quite like it. Uh, there's nothing I enjoy more than to turn off my cell phone, be all alone, and the way I do that is I get up real early in the morning so there's no threat of being called. 
and it's me and the Lord in the text. And that is, that is just such a joy. Not just to study the Bible to gain more information, but to see the beauty of the Lord. It's just, it's, do, do, you, do you do that? Do you just steal away sometime and just read the Bible just to get to know the Lord? That's what he's talking about. That's exactly what he's talking about. I have a classmate in seminary named Tom Constable. Uh, Tom ended up teaching Bible at the seminary for 45 years. And he taught the English Bible, books of the Bible, and being a very diligent student, kept great notes. He has published those notes free on the internet. As a matter of fact, I highly recommend that if you have a question about the Bible, you simply type in Constable's Notes and every book of the Bible is there. And this fella is a very good student of the scripture. He really has insight. And he's, he's read everything. It's not unusual in some of the books I've uh, looked at from him. He has 500 footnotes, meaning he's looked at that many sources. He's a diligent student of the scripture. Well, he could still be teaching, but he resigned. He retired when it came because the notes were so popular around the world that he's ministering to more people through those notes on the Internet than he is in class, though he's teaching future preachers. Wow. And so he came to this passage, and he came to this verse, and here is what he said in part. After he retired, he dedicated himself to nothing but studying the word just so he could refine the notes, which he is constantly doing. And he said this, These have been the most wonderful years of my life, have had the opportunity and privilege to dwell in the house of the Lord, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to meditate in his temple. The Lord has given me time to concentrate on his word, and to get it out to people around the world. Thank you, Lord. But notice what he said. These have been the most wonderful years of my life. Just steal away somewhere. Just get to know the Lord, which you're going to do by concentrating on him in his word. So David is saying, look, I'm confident the Lord is going to protect me because of my experience and my exposure to his word. So he says in verse 5, for the time of trouble he will hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he will hide me. He will set me high upon a rock. All of which is to say, the Lord is going to protect me. Now this part of the psalm is concluded in verse 6. He says, And now my head shall be lifted above the enemies all around. Therefore I will offer the sacrifice, sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes I will sing praises to the Lord. So the key here is simply this. I have confidence in the Lord that he is going to protect me. Only the way he says it in this verse is he's going to lift up my head above my enemies. He's going to set me on a rock. So the idea is uh, he's going to protect me. That is the point. All right. There's a second point that he makes, which we'll get to in a minute. But before we do, I want to just repeat one more time. In these opening verses, he begins by just expressing his confidence in the Lord. And that confidence comes primarily from concentrating on the Lord himself, we would say through the word, and from experience. I've trusted the Lord before. So here's the question. When you get in a mess, are you trusting the Lord? 
are you trusting you? Is your confidence in the Lord or is there confidence in the fact that you will solve this problem or be able to get out of the danger that you're in? I submit to you that too often we try first to get out of it on our own ingenuity and then and only when that doesn't work do we think to get to the Lord. When it gets real serious, then is when we take it to the Lord. Well, what David does, he hasn't even asked the Lord to protect him. That's next. He just starts out the shoot and says, I'm confident the Lord's going to do it. And that only comes when you're exposed to this book and when you've had past experiences that the Lord is going to do it. So here's the issue. Are you trusting you? Are you trusting the Lord? Are you doing it your way or his way? I read a story once about a lady, I think she was in Scotland, who somehow was selling things house to house, and she had to decide which road to go down next. And she was known to have habitually taken a stick and threw it in the air, and however it landed, that's the way she would go. And one day they saw her, and she was standing there, and she kept throwing the stick up. And they said, well, what's going on? She said, well, it keeps landing right, and I want to go left. <laughs> That's trusting the stick, isn't it? So you read your Bible, and you go to church, and then you do what you want to do. Or you keep something uh, the Bible till you find a verse that fits what you want to do, right? So you go in your way or his way. Are you confident that the Lord is your shepherd? That's critical. I mean, down in the deep inner recesses of your soul, are you confident the Lord is going to take care of you? Now, that's how he starts. Then he continues by crying out to the Lord for help. Now, he's already expressed the idea the Lord's going to deliver me in more ways than one. He's expressed that. But yet he says in verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon me and answer me. Now what you need to note in this verse is that prior to this, he's been talking about the Lord. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my life. The Lord is my strength. He's going to set me on a rock. It's him, him, him. Now all of a sudden, he talks to the Lord. And he says, Lord, Hear me. And the point apparently is, answer me. So apparently the Lord was not granting David the protection that he thought he would get promptly. And so he prays earnestly and with some anxiety perhaps. Lord, hear me. And this is emphasized in verse 8 where he says, When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, will I seek. Now, he's referring to some things tucked away in the Mosaic law where the Lord constantly says, seek me, seek me. And so David, uh, with a little anxiety perhaps, is saying, now, I'm confident you're going to work, but just in case, hear me. And, 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 and you said, seek, and Lord, that's what I'm doing. I'm seeking. So he says in verse 9, Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation, my deliverance. Now, let's think about this. Was David a sinner? Yeah. Was he ever? Yeah, he was. So there are passages in the Psalms where he comes and says, I've sinned, forgive me. But I want you to notice what he says in this passage. He says, I'm your servant. Now let me give you a little hint about how to pray when it's real critical. You come before the Lord and you say, Lord, I'm your child. Remember me? 
That's what he's doing. He's saying, hey, hey, don't forget me. I'm here. Remember me. What are you saying in school? Pick me, pick me. <laughs> well, that's what he's doing. And he's saying, you are, I'm your servant, and uh, you're the Lord, I'm the servant, and you are my helper. So that's the way you pray. Don't hesitate to say, Lord, I'm, oh, I've done this uh, on more than one occasion when it just piled up and I couldn't get it all done. And I said, Lord, would you please get this stupid computer to work? I'm just trying to do something for you. And I said it in that tone of voice. <laughs> right. You just say, Lord, help. I, remember who I am? Remember me? I'm your servant. I serve you, so protect me. That's the idea. But what is really, this is what I really like about this. He says, look, you said seek and I did. Wow, what a great verse that we could just say, Lord, you said right here, and I did. Could you ever say that? How many times can you say that? You find verses, you, well, I did that one. You find this one, well, I'm not sure I did that one. And what the Lord wants us to do is, you said it, I did it. Almost like an echo. As a matter of fact, I, back in the days when they had organs in churches, there was a pastor who went into the auditorium and the organist was practicing on the piano. I'm sorry, the organ. And he noticed that every time the organ hit uh, a low D, there was a window admitting a rattling sound on the same pitch. So the organ hit low D, and the window echoed back low D. He said the phenomenon was known as sympathetic vibration. Never heard that term, but... That's what the Lord wants out of us, is sympathetic vibration. <laughs> he said, seek, and we seek. He said, pray, we pray. And so David said, Lord, I did it. You, you, you said seek, and I'm seeking. So now, Lord, I need your help. So he goes on to say, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think he thought his mother and father were going to forsake him? Father may be mother never. <laughs> you know, children sometimes feel like their father's not around, but not their mother. Now, those are, there are some exceptions. Those are very, 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 very rare. There's nothing quite like a mother's love. Nothing. I will never forget. When I was pastor of Church of the Open Door, and we invited Dr. McGee to come back and speak at his old church, and he preached, and the place was packed. And he got down to the end of the service, and he prayed, and he said, God, we thank you for the mother love of the Father God. Oh, wow. There's nothing like a mother's love. Mother is going to be the last person to desert you. There are a few exceptions, but thank God they're few and far between, right? Matter of fact, mothers are blinded by their love sometimes. That's why you need fathers. But anyway, <laughs> moving right along, what David says in this passage is, hypothetically, if my mother and father were to sake me, if that were possible, and it's not in his case, then the Lord will take care of me. All he's saying is that those who are closest to him, hear me, those who are the most supportive, are you listening, may desert you, but not the Lord. So he's simply saying, Lord, you love me more than mother. It's the mother love of the Father God. You love me. Then you protect me. Then he says in verse 11, Teach me your way. Lead me in the smooth path. Because of my enemies, 
Ah, he's got enemies. He's in danger because of his enemies. He's afraid because of his enemies. And he doesn't know how to handle it. So what he says is, Lord, teach me. Lead me. That's what he's saying. So in this section where he's crying out to the Lord, he's saying, answer me. Don't forsake me. And now he's saying, but tell me, give me some instruction here. Give me some lead way. Tell me how to get out of this. Matter of fact, he says it very plainly in verse 12. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I mean, just look at what he's facing. False witnesses they are against him. They slandered him. They are violent. They swore to destroy him. Remember earlier in the passage, they wanted to eat him. Pretty vivid for destruction. So he's saying, Lord, you deliver me. That's what he's praying for. Do not deliver me to the will of the adversary. And the point is, deli you deliver me from them. So he says in verse 13, I would have lost heart unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, to lose heart means I would have been discouraged. Except for the fact that I believed. Don't miss it. I believed. I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now what does that mean? I believe he's going to protect me and I'm not going to die. That's what it means. And I'm going to live to see the goodness of the Lord while I'm still alive. Amen. That's what he's saying. So I look at this passage and I think of James chapter 1 where he says, Count it all joy when you fall into various kinds of trials, knowing this, that the trying of your patience is what God has in mind to bring you to spiritual maturity. And then he says this, listen carefully. If you lack wisdom, ask. So in the midst of a trial, if you don't know what to do next, ask. And then, on top of that, he says this, nothing wavering. That's what David is doing in this passage. He started out with, Lord, I have confidence in you, but I need your help. So I'm going to ask for wisdom. I want you to tell me what to do in this situation. Lead me. Teach me. Give me wisdom. And I'm going to... I'm not going to be discouraged because I'm confident that I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. All right. So far, David's done two things. Number one, he's expressed this confidence in the Lord. Number two, he's cried out to the Lord to be delivered. He does one more thing, which is incredibly interesting to me. He says in the last verse, verse 14, wait on the Lord. Now, wait a minute. Who's he talking to now? Remember in the first part of the passage, he was talking about the Lord. Then there came a break where he talked to the Lord. And now... He's back talking about the Lord. He's not talking to the Lord anymore. And he apparently is talking to the readers. Mm -hmm. He's talking to me. He's talking to you. And he says, let me tell you what I've learned. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Mm -hmm. Ah. That, I think, was an encouragement to him to be able to say, uh, I've gone through this experience, I've learned to not be discouraged, but to be encouraged. I've learned to wait on the Lord. And so now what he's doing is he's giving counsel to other people who may be going through this. And he's saying, let me tell you what I've learned. You need to wait on the Lord. And I'm sure that encouraged him. But, obviously, he's trying to encourage other people. By the way, the word translated wait means to look for, to hope, to expect. 
So this is waiting with expectation that the Lord is going to answer. And that's his advice to us. When you are facing fearful danger, then what you need to do is what David did in this passage. You need to be confident that the Lord is going to deliver you. Then you need to just pray that he delivers you. And when all of that happens, you need to give some counsel to other people. Teach them, which will, con which will help you to learn to trust the Lord the next time this situation comes up. That sort of sums it up. When you're facing a fearful danger, such as people forsaking you or wanting to do you harm or even desire to devour you, here's what you need to do. Reflect on the Lord's past deliverance. Seek Him. Trust Him. Wait on Him. Do not fear. Be of good cheer. Let the Lord be your strength. So may I say, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Someone has said, give God time. And even when the knife flashes in the air, the ram will be seen in the thicket. Give God time. And even when Pharaoh's host is on Israel's heels, a path through the water may suddenly open. Give God time, and when the bed of the brook is dry, Elijah will hear the guiding voice. Wait, I say. Wait on the Lord. It has been said to force open a rosebud of God's promises prematurely, to help the butterfly of providence slip from the cocoon of his hidden purposes is to spoil the beauty of the coming blessing and stun the flight of our dearest aspirations. Wait, I say. Wait on the Lord. Wait. Wait on the Lord with expectation. Wait. Trust the Lord. As only Spurgeon can say it, he said, Wait at his door with prayer. Wait at his feet with humility. Wait at his table with service. Wait at his window with expectation. Wait on the Lord, I say. Wait on the Lord. One famous author said, Patience may be bitter, but its fruit is sweet. Wait on the Lord. I began by telling you of three people in this congregation who recently have experienced a threat of fearful danger. I didn't tell you what happened. I told you of a lady who was in the middle of the night going to her car <coughs> down some dark, narrow alleyways. She prayed. She's okay. I told you about a lady who uh, was a clerk and nearby there were some armed robberies and she was concerned. I sent her some passages of scripture and I think what she did is wrote them out and pinned them on her dress. <laughs> she trusted the Lord and she's okay. The one I thought was most interesting was the fellow who was filling up his gas tank at a filling station. When three or four guys in another car who were drunk looked at him and one of them said, let's, uh, let's uh, do something to him. Let's get him. Now that fella knows the Lord and the word. And so he did what all the others have done and what we should do. He just said, Lord, help. Amen. And he told me, one of the three or four said to the guy that was coming after him, to the guy that was coming after him, don't do that. Put him in the car, and they drove away. Does the Lord protect us? Wait, I say. 
with expectation, wait on the Lord. Father, thank you.